G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is author of 537 Days of Winter, David Knopf. David is an Australian Antarctic expedition leader, and David has also served in the ADF previous to this. He has joined us today to talk about his life and this remarkable tale of resilience and endurance. Hi, David. Thanks for joining us on the show. G'day, Adam. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to be here. No, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to have you on, mate. And so there's a there's a question that I want to ask you is, what is it about Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena that resonates so strongly with you? Yeah, good one. So that's actually, that. yeah, it's in the, the first pages of the book. You know, when you're writing a, as, a, as a former soldier in a, in a kind of modern uh, memoir, you have to put a, a quote or a, a phrase or a the poem in the front so that's that's my choice and it resonates with me because it was something that like at, when i was stuck down in antarctica when the pandemic broke out and we were down there for much longer than we wanted to everyone was an expert of, of why and how they could have done it differently we could have come home or not as planned and all these other things of uh, were coming up and, and around and as the station leader i copped a lot of uh questions around that that on behalf of then the powers that be above us who were back in australia making those decisions i had to front those those questions and 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 so did the rest of the team. We were all in this bizarre scenario, and there was no answers to a lot of those questions. Uh, yet it was this case of just you're going to face scrutiny, you're going to make mistakes, but you just have to keep going forward. And that was when I listened to a, a recording of the the man in the arena uh, from YouTube or something like that, and and heard it, and it just spoke to me in terms of you know it, it doesn't matter what anyone's saying and it's very easy to sit on the sidelines and you see this with sports players and, and politicians and everyone sits there go oh they should do this or what an idiot he could have kicked that goal or who can't kick a goal from directly in front and you're like well with a hundred thousand people watching you it's pretty tough so the the credit must go to the man in the arena and it's it's not the critic that counts uh, it really spoke to me then and helped me in some of the darker times when i knew i wasn't getting it right and was facing scrutiny or getting a lot of questions about why you've done something. And it was like, no, it's, it's all right. You're the, you're the man in the arena and that's what counts. So let's just go back a little bit and let's uh, tell me about David Knopf as a young fellow. What was it like growing up for you and where did you grow up and what did you do sport wise? And do you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah. So I, I grew up in uh, the outer Eastern suburbs of, of Melbourne, a place called Glen Waverley. Um, Famous from uh, the, the Living End were from out that way as well. Actually, I think it's the best claim to fame from our neighbouring suburb in Willis Hill. Uh, grew up out there. i got an older brother, younger sister, pretty tight family. We had a family business in auto automotive parts as a wholesaler. So dad ran that and mum was uh, mum was involved as well. Um, and we all worked there in the school holidays and, and on weekends. So the, the family business was really the core of it. And dad was was very big on that. Um, yeah, then it then had a real kind of, turn when uh when dad dad unfortunately died when i was i was 13 just dropped us off at school one day and and, and we never saw him again so it was oh, i would never saw him alive again um and that that really threw us as a family you know dad had, and the business had been the core of it and so then mum had to kind of take over the business and and run it for a couple of years to get it to a transitional point to then get out of the business and and that changed that i was 13 my brother was a couple of years older my sister was you know 18 months younger and that kind of really set the tone for the three of us to just be pretty independent teenagers that you didn't have a lot of time to just be a recalcitrant pain in the ass um, when you, you've got a single parent running a business and raising three kids. And she had a great support network. And, and I think that was something that taught us as a as a family uh, a lot about resilience and just getting it done and, and making do and not not complaining about what you could have and, and how better it could be. But um, I, I loved – Loved it out there. I, I played a bit of basketball. I showed a little bit of promise. I, I did play with the rep team, the Nunawad Inspectors, for a couple of years out there, but never really – was certainly never considering uh, full-time sports or anything. My, my brother was the athlete in the family. He was a uh, really pretty pretty budding cyclist and went over to Europe and rode for a bit as well. So, yeah. So – and. I'm hearing you talk and, and obviously the loss of any family member, but your your father at 13, did that sort of instill in you that life's short, obviously, you know, with the loss of your father, life's short and you've got to make the most of every opportunity that you've presented? I, like I wouldn't say consciously, but probably. You, you look back in hindsight and, and you're just reminded that, oh, yeah, don't take anything for granted. 
things can change pretty quickly. And and it's it's I go into this in the book in terms of the the parallels to the pandemic. So my uncle had had polio as a kid. He's one of the last Australians to have it. And that is something that was something that's always in in the family that oh, you know, Michael had polio and he got on with life. And and it had a bit of an impact on him, but he he'd really just got on with it and was able to live a, a you know an amazing life. And he's he was really good inspiration for everyone around him to to not focus on the fact that oh, yeah, he's yeah, that's what happened. And my my mum's mum had died when she was young as well. So we had this family history of challenges, and they're not unique. It, it's it's funny how now in this day and age, a lot of these things that they're less common than they were sort of 50, 60 years ago when our parents' generation were around. So, yeah, that was – it did have an impact and, uh, yeah. So, for you, obviously, you had to grow up quick, like a lot quicker than what you first wanted to in your teenage years. So, what was your first job? Uh, Well, first first job was was working at the family business, much younger than uh, the – the government would allow but dad used to pay us in happy meals and and maccas or the odd bit of cash here and then mowing lawns and whatnot my first proper job uh was actually at maccas maccas mount waverley working out there and uh i loved it oh, it was a great little social team you knew a lot of the other kids working there from from primary school in the area so that was something like i had and i had a pretty good little social scene and you'd go out as little Macca's crew and there was always just house parties in the weekend at someone, the older kids' houses. And yeah, it was, I, I, I enjoyed it. No, and, and and still to this day, every time I go into a Macca's, you kind of look at how they've changed their systems and they're very, very systematic, very process driven. I think that was something good to learn early in the workforce. So what did you do after high school? Obviously graduated high school. Did you go off to uni and what did you do? Yeah, so I'd, I'd always wanted to be uh, an engineer or a, and then and a point, a fighter pilot and the defence force and that style of lifestyle had had appealed to me, probably based on having watched Top Gun as a kid and, and not much more. I had no military history in the family other than, you know, grandpas in the Second World War sort of thing, but, you know, as everyone did. And went to uni, got into engineering at Monash and was like, oh, yeah, this is good. And it did a year or so of that and just went, this is so boring um nothing against engineers but it certainly wasn't really looking like a career that was gonna challenge me and and keep me excited the whole way and that's when my dreams of being a fighter pilot had kind of been crushed by being too tall was and too tall and and slightly short-sighted they're like oh you can't fly jets but you can fly hercules i'm like Yeah, nothing against Herc pilots, but uh, it wasn't for me at, at 18. I didn't want to do it. Um, and so I joined, joined the Army Reserve and then straight away just loved it. I'm like, oh, this is for me. I, I need to do this. So raced through all the courses there and and had a blast. And then by, I think it was by about third year uni, I was like, forget uni. Let's let's go. Um, let's, let's do the Army thing. So I went on to full-time service and went across the Solomon Islands as a platoon commander in 2007. With a with a platoon there, and that was just an absolute blast. And I'm like, this is this is what I want to do with my life. And not necessarily in uniform. We, we were working as part of Regional Assistance Mission Solomon Islands back then. And, and you know, as, as it went on, you're working with the Australian High Commission in Honiara, the local Solomon Islands Police Force. You're working with AFP. You're working with you know uh, Papua New Guineans and Fijians and Tongans and, and different coalition partners. And, and that was what appealed to me. I'm like, this is amazing. Like being out here on the world stage is great. And I was toying with a career in army you know, in in uniform. And then when I, I got back and and you know hung around for a little bit longer and decided, you know what, I'm gonna you know not not stick stick around in uniform. I'll get out of that and get into a suit. And that's when I joined Foreign Affairs and Trade. And so from that, when you're over in the Solomon Islands, did you what you learnt, and we'll obviously get to it later on, and, and the experiences that you had before you got to Antarctica. But did that first experience? Did you did you take anything from that from that experience when you were in Antarctica? I, the one thing I learnt from that. So I was 22 or 23 as the platoon commander. So on the younger side of the entire platoon as well, um, and. What I learned then was back back yourself in terms of your training and your experience going into something. But for like God, like listen to everyone around you. You are not an expert, and even when you in later life when you kind of are an expert, the best experts are not experts. They'll listen to everyone around them. They'll they'll take 
take the opinions of anyone and everyone and then make the correct decision after that. And that was something that I learned really early on in that tour and and carried on for the rest of my life of, of just listen to everyone where you can and use the experience you've got around you and then you'll be able to make the right decisions regardless of what you think you can, you how good you think you are. So you mentioned that you began working for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and you were working for the Australian High Commission in Islamabad. Can you tell us a little bit about that yeah. and the exciting po- like the posting that that would have been? Oh, th- that was an absolute ball. And, and people do ask, they go, oh, when you joined DFAT, why didn't you go to Paris or Tokyo or New York? You're like, Pfft. We get along with most of them until the submarine deal went south. Um, yeah, we get along with all of them and it, it's fine. So why would you go posted there? So I went to Pakistan. I had originally was supposed to go into Afghanistan with with the, the team there and then went, oh, and then there was a change of plans. And I was then posted into the Islamabad. And it, Pakistan is, is such a fascinating country. It's got this spectacular mountain regions in the north and this really – interesting history in terms of its split from India after the British Raj ended and and its identity kind of crisis around is it is it's a um is it an Islamic state which it's not it's technically a secular state and yet it's still you know it's, it's like 90 percent Islamic and and the, the treatment of minorities and everything's quite interesting and issues like you're seeing now with these floods in Pakistan and how they deal with these large scale earthquakes and floods and natural disasters yet at the same time spent a lot of money on their nuclear weapons program in case the indians attack them first so and they had to deal with this militancy problem so you've got this really fascinating mixing part of of, of a country and, and how it's trying to deal with these problems and where over they're trying to tell them how to do things and i was there predominantly working on uh their counter-terrorism policy with them and, and counter-radicalization programs and other things which are very hard to gauge success um and very very hard to kind of really know what impact you might be having but you you keep going and it was such a dynamic time to be there uh, i got there just after they'd they'd killed bin laden in abadabad um and spent you know three and a half nearly four years in there working with all the different coalition partners and the, the pakistanis and at the same time getting out and enjoying it much like and i hate to to use movies as good representations of what life's like because they're movies but um whiskey tango foxtrot as a movie and what it's like and what it was like to live in islamabad and kabul and those cities at the height of the war that movie actually has some pretty uh pretty good representations of that so when you're in country and obviously you you were there for a long time did like the fear of what was happening in Afghanistan and and did you were you fearful that you could be killed at at any moment whilst you were over there and living in Pakistan? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I had a couple of sliding doors moments where you, you'd go past one set of shops or like miss your turn off or you can't get a park and then you kind of go, oh, I'll just do do something else and then you find out later that yeah, there was a suicide bombing at that particular location. You know. The, the the moment you would have been there, and you're like, oh yeah, um, you know, got got shot at in the car just driving down the highway. Someone just arced up once, just firing AK rounds at the car, and you, you know, hearing them whiz whiz over the, over the top of them, like a Honda Civic. So by by no means an armored vehicle, and but but that sort of stuff was just Pakistan. Um, yet you know, every day, 250, 300 million people would not have any dramas, and then what made the news was was all these incidents, but. It's tough in those countries. Life is really – it's it's very different. You've got the families and I always found it really it really hit home when you, you're working, especially down in places like um, Sindh where a lot of the floods are now and you're down south and out of the big cities. These families, they might have five or six kids that you know, they've got – the infant mortality rates are really high over there, childhood malnutrition, which is something that AusAid were really big on we were working on. When I was there, and you're trying to focus on these programs to just give kids and families a chance, but you know, you're trying to talk to a family in, in southern Pakistan about a balanced diet, and they're like, "Well, we've got rice, and it's uh, about it." And you're like, "Oh, well, you know, yeah, let's let's get more greens into that." And it's just, they're living in a desert, so it was tough to see that stuff, and 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 it hits home, and and everyone knew someone that had been killed, and in, in either militancy or from and, and such a shame that you're yeah, often preventable conditions and diseases and stuff that um yeah back here aren't problems 
So did you, when you were over there, did you, you, you obviously would have seen some beautiful parts of the country too. What what was your favourite part of, of Pakistan when you when you were living over there? Oh, up, up in the north, so like Gilgit, Baltistan, and these these ancient forts that kind of run through the valleys up north, through Swat Valley and north of there and across the, like the Hindu Kush and into the Karakoram Range and K2 and, and uh, Fairy Meadows and, and Naga Parbat and some of these like 8,000 metre peaks. And to, and the, the, the shame is like there's so few tourists up there. So when you do get up there, which you know you, we were able to, you're the only ones there. So it's, it's really incredible. Whereas you go across to Nepal, uh, the, yeah, I've done the Annapurna circuit and stuff like that, and yeah, it's it's a highway. There's people everywhere, um, but yeah, you can do the same stuff in Pakistan. You're, you're the only people there. It's great. So after your time in Pakistan, you took a sabbatical for diplomacy. Why? Yep. Why was why was that? And what led you to Turkey, working as a freelance photographer? <laughs> Oh, it was, it was a very simple answer. There was a girl. Um, so... <laughs> we, all, we all follow the girl. Yeah, right? we all, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then weirdly, years later, um, I was chatting to my grandma and apparently my dad had years earlier chased a girl to Istanbul as well. Some Greek girl he'd met on holidays in Europe <laughs> chased her to Istanbul for a year. So I, no, I'd met a, met a lovely French girl when I was working in Pakistan and, and she was then working uh, for the UN over in Turkey. And so yeah, I took took a took a break from diplomacy. Went and well, we lived together over there for a year, and I've floundered around as a as a freelance photographer and did some other kind of things and travelled around Europe. We travelled around Turkey and had an absolute ball of a time. And until it got to a point of like, oh, I need to go get another job, or I need to go back to <laughs> need to go back to work, or I'll never be allowed back. And um, and that's when I took on my next adventure, which was to to go into Iraq with the coalition task group. There, as part of the the mission to train and equip and and advise the Iraqis uh, to counter ISIS, and that was 2016, 16, 17, something, whatever, whatever that was, whenever Iraq War Three was. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Trying yeah. try to remember, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what was that like for you? And and trying to combat ISIS, what 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 did you take away from that experience? Yeah, uh, that was fascinating. I mean, the work was pretty straightforward. My job, I was embedded with the Australian task group um, just north of Baghdad, and I sort of get to fly between the, the we had the task group up north, one at at BDSC, the main airport, and then and between the embassy. So I did get to travel around a bit, which broke it up, and got to see the whole war or the the coalition element of it in a in its in a bigger picture way which really opened my eyes in up to like oh wow the, the scale of these operations is is phenomenal and that you're talking about division and brigade level movements which and army level movements that the Australian army just had never really operated in and and even in uh Afghanistan in the war in, in between Pakistan and Afghanistan it was it was so counterinsurgent that you're only ever using small small teams you, and and at most you, you, you combine battle groups and, and task forces. Yeah, they've got a lot of moving parts and air support and all sorts of things, but they weren't like division level moves up to, to Basra and Mosul. So that was kind of cool to see a conventional war play out um, and how we could help the Iraqis do that and, and training and equip them. But it was, what what was also fascinating is the history of, of the region. So I've, I studied history at uni as a, as a minor and, it was, I remember one, there was one day when I was, because we were an ANZAC task group up there, as, as Australians often are, um, deployed with the Kiwis. And there was this bunch of like Kiwi lads that had just flown in and were talking about the anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which is the line that the French and the British had drawn, drawn across Syria and Iraq and created the modern day borders at the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And these lads, and I'll, I'll do I'll do my Kiwi accent, they're like, oh, what's like... What's all that about? And you're just going like, guys, didn't you pay attention to your briefings? And they like, oh yeah, we something about like, oh, there's a line, like I don't know. And you go, uh, guys, like, and you pull out a map and you just go through the history of like, okay, well, this is Iraq War Three. There was Iraq War Two. There was Iraq War One. Then before that, there was the Iran Iraq War, and that's where all these leftover tanks and most of that equipment was all from that. And then before that, there was you know a period of stability, and then you had this like puppet regimes and they had all the like this the history of these regions and what we're fighting over and you're trying to explain 
that that line was drawn that cut the Kurds in half because modern day Turkey only like when and at a Turk what they wanted they wanted like a divided Kurdistan sort of suited their needs and then the British and the French didn't really care because they're trying to deal with you know the fact that they're broke after the First World War and, and then at the end of the day they just go cool these are the lines on the maps and that'll do and you're trying to explain that to to kind of young soldiers out of Australia or New Zealand or America or wherever they've come from, they've landed in this war that's been going for thousands of years or hundreds of years. It's it's fascinating. And I, I enjoyed that part of it to kind of end up, you know, teaching history in the middle of a war zone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a pretty, a pretty uh, you know, amazing classroom, I'd say, that you when you studied your history, you'd, you'd never thought yeah. you'd be in the middle of a war zone going, um, giving lectures on, you know, the history of, of the, of the but, country and yeah. Yeah. But what, what I loved about it, and, and this is something that now, you know, they talk about it, but to see it in practice that the strategic soldier or the strategic corporal, I think they used to call it, but it's every soldier needs to know what the hell you're doing. And, and it was, you know, I, I say that that story kind of works better if if you go, oh, they didn't know anything. They did know something, and the, the briefing processes and the, tr- the lead up training, everything had worked, and they were keen to learn about what are we doing here? Why? Who are we actually helping? What are all these different groups? What's the the Sunni Shia split, and what are these other factions and minorities? And that's fascinating. That in modern warfare, that every level of of soldier, civilian, or whoever's involved in it. You have to know the whole story because l- decisions you make or errors you make can cause, you know, strategic level or you know, diplomatic incidents. And that was credit to the the Aussie and Kiwi and, and American soldiers that I worked with. That they were all pretty switched on to the bigger picture of what was going on over there. Well, I, th- I think it's like you like you said, Dave. I think it's important because in in the First World War and the study, like you know. It was like so many people just go. Oh, it was it was for four years. They they just charged over the top of trenches and they just ran into machine gun fire. Well, no, that's mm. that's not right. It's you know like the the war was forever. You know, it was the first mm. industrial war and it was the, you know it was an evolving war that every day things were changing and you know technology was you know it, it's it's fascinating yeah. because technology in that war was just we advanced so far with technology oh, yeah. and 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 medicine and and you know planes and everything that yep. you know it wasn't just men running over the top into machine gun fire and, and that's I think that's where you're right we've evolved and our defense forces have done really well in mm. in the study of you know I see that and I speak to veterans and they go yeah no we we know the history of of the army or we know the history of the you know the air force or the navy or and I think it's something that's that is good and like you're saying it's it's a really mm. key point that you touch on that you know pe- gone are the days that people are going to a war going what am I doing here like what am I why am I fighting yeah oh and the the, the rapid change during times of conflict like oh, there's a great quote from uh, Lenin the kind of the communist not the the beetle but saying you know there are there are decades where nothing happens and there are years where decades happen. And we're very much living in that period of time right now since, since COVID and the war, yeah, COVID, the war in Ukraine, the the death of Queen Elizabeth II and the transition of power there and the, the debates that's now opening up, which is, uh, which is interesting. And, but you, you're right. I mean, the first world war started with cavalry charges and ended with combined, combined arms warfare and air to air combat and tanks you go. And it basically then paused. And then the, the second world war, the Germans kind of, they kept developing and everyone else went, you know, oh, no, that's all right. We'll build the Maginot Line and, and we'll be fine. And then, the, the you know, the Germans turned up and they'd really taken command arms warfare and the, the Blitzkrieg and everything to to the next level. And yet this, I, I love, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could plug another podcast, but I love listening to um, the We Have Wa- we have Ways of Making You Talk podcast and Dan Carlin for the history buffs out there on your podcast. If you're not onto those two podcast you'll learn so much but about the differences of the reason blitzkrieg worked so well at the start of the second world war and they were able to invade france so and through belgium and, and everything in france so quickly is because france at the time was the most order they like, had the most automotive infrastructure so it had fuel stations that had really good roads and so they were able to drive through so then when it came to barbarossa and they're trying to go east there was there was none of that so through romania and ukraine and, and the, these regions no one had motor cars no one had petrol no one no none of the local mechanics knew anything there was no spare parts it was nothing but so it didn't work and you go well actually 
yeah, so it was Blitzkrieg as amazing as they say it was. It was just a case of actually the French and, and France was just really well set up for a rapid advance at the time. Um, so I, I, I love some of these debates, but I'm also fascinated by what's going on in Ukraine and, and getting to to watch a, you know, it's, it's such a tragic kind of scenario that's playing out over there, but the, the military buff and historian side of me, you just look at it and you go, ooh, back to – Back to conventional war, like we're you know sending bushmasters over and, and helping the Ukrainians. You go, yeah. When has a bushmaster ever been up against modern Russian anti tank weapons? Let's, let's see how that goes. And some of these little things about, and you only know what you know from the media, um, and then but knowing what you know from my you knowing what I know from my time in Iraq and Pakistan and stuff, you, you know a lot of the other capabilities and and skills and bits of kit that are out there, and you kind of go, oh, I wonder. How's that happening? Well, how do they do that? And what's the the miscommunication here and some of the propaganda stuff from both sides to to achieve their goals? Well, it's it's a key point. it's a key point you touch on because you know we we look at the you know what's happening with the war in Ukraine. We look at what's happening in China and where you served in the Solomon Islands and how that's playing out. And what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's fascinating. So the whole so Ramsey, um, the regional system Solomon Islands that I was part of in two thousand eight had gone back in in two thousand and seven because or early two thousand eight I think it was around two thousand seven. Um, because the the local population had, had burnt Chinatown to the ground due to you know perceived Chinese influence, and they were trying to tell the Chinese to get out and uh, burn Chinatown to the ground. And and interesting, like So Gravari, I think he was the opposition leader at the time. He's now the prime minister. So it's the same sort of political figures hanging around, and the same arguments and, and issues. But I, I don't want to really get too far into to my own political stances on some of it. But you go well, I feel like if 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 a government in the Pacific really sidle up to China and pick that side, the short-term gain in terms of, yeah, you might get some lucrative contracts or you might they might build a port. Like China's aid and international diplomacy programs, they generally do what they – what whatever you want, they'll t- sort of do it quicker than ourselves or the Americans or, or anyone else might be able to, but – Long term, is it the best thing for your nation to have a Chinese operated port facility built with Chinese labor to Chinese standards for, for Chinese purposes with a massive soft loan or kind of a hard, like a soft loan now that becomes a hard loan and you're indebted to China? Like, it, now we do similar things with our aid programs. It's not always necessarily free and you don't always necessarily get what you want. You kind of get what it's a mutually agreed thing that, you know, that. We may not build you a port, but we'll build you a, a department of uh, of maritime industry or, or something like that. But and do some capacity building to help you build your own port. And and uh, but it'll take you twenty years to get your port, whereas the Chinese will turn up and build a port. And some of these things that it, it's interesting. Perhaps uh, we spent the last twenty years focused on the war on terror and in the Middle East areas that have very little historic strategic interest to Australia yet. As part of the ANZUS treaties and our, our coalition commitments to, to NATO and others, we were absolutely involved. And now it's a case of like, okay, what's happening in the Pacific? What's happening in the South China Sea? What's happening in Ukraine? And did did Russia and China just spend the last twenty years not as focused on terrorism uh, and focus on modernising their militaries? And yeah, yeah, we're, we're kind of way off topic here, but these are this is, no, this is no, like no, a no, no, strategic no, policy yeah. podcast now rather than history. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, it's good, mate, to, because, you know, like, and you're right, like, it's, it's good to have these discussions because I think it's important that, like you said, maybe we did drop the ball a bit and time will tell. Time will tell and, you know, we can only tell by time of what's going to happen in the future and, you know, we... We'll we'll watch this space. Well, you know, we could we could be getting you back on and going, ah. hey, Dave, you, you were right. Well, you know, but to to segue, yeah. well, to segue it to, to Antarctica, which I think was the main thing we're supposed to talk about today. We haven't even, haven't even got there yet. But um, <laughs> it's a fascinating thing because down there, so it's the last kind of really. It, it, there's a the Antarctic treaty system is uh, it, it's not the most robust of treaty systems in the world. It's there, so Australia has a forty two percent claim, um, which was the old British claim that then became ours. And it's it's a you know, huge amount of territory. There's not a lot in that territory other than the coastline and the, the stations we've got. There's just this huge chunk of ice and it's not necessarily recognised by everyone else as well. So we've got it. 
we've got our stations there, but within our territory, there's Chinese stations, Indian stations, Russian stations. The French have a claim that's sort of a slice of pie in the middle of our claim, but we get along really well with the French and, and everyone gets along down there. So I found that fascinating. I was, I was lucky enough. And I think I visited about 12 different Antarctic stations. Um, so Chinese, Russian, Argentinian, Chilean, Indian, and, and uh, yeah, an old British station and stuff as well. And, Everyone has the same challenges down there that, that unifies that, that you couldn't go it alone. If any nation decided that, hey, we're going to go to Antarctica and set up ourselves and be purely self-sufficient, and even the Americans are pretty close to that, but McMurdo Station, their main base, is pretty close to New Zealand. It's got a cleaner shot in terms of annual sea ice, but you go... Oh, at any point, if they have a problem, they'll need the assets from from Australia or the French or, or the Chinese and others. So everyone has to get along because you know that if you don't get along and you say, no, we're doing it our way, we don't want to ever work with you again, if they have an emergency or a shipboard fire or, or a, a, an aircraft, a downed aircraft or something, they'll have to call the other partner nations and say, hey, hey we've got a downed aircraft in this region have you got assets? And you go, yep, yeah, we can uh, we can support that. And everyone flies around and, and sails down there with mutual support in terms of medical and, and uh, maritime support and evacuation plans, so that you you've got an option. So it's it's a great segue into talking about Antarctica and how how you actually got yeah. to Antarctica. So how did you well, how, where did your love for Antarctica start, and and how did you become a, a leader at the Davis Research Station, and and like it seems so you're in the Middle East, and now you're in now you're in Antarctica. So yeah. how did this happen? Yeah, so weirdly, um, the the High Commissioner to Pakistan when I was there, Peter Haywood, um, I'm sure he's a listener, and he he'd worked with the Australian Antarctic Program. So he he and I had a chat once in my office in Islamabad when he was sort of handing me a, a red penned cable as as all junior diplomats right and he he sort of went oh you should uh, you should think about it one day because he, he knew that i was i was planning a trip down there with some mates um we were going to charter a yacht out of south america and sail down there and do some mountaineering and split boarding which we ended up doing at the end of my post into pakistan and half the boat had been in pakistan the other half had been in afghanistan and, and so we're all pretty cashed up after those couple of years and down we went and we went down there to, to, to climb mountains and do cool stuff and and we did that but it was the environment and the the wildlife that really captured me and i thought this is so spectacular and such an incredible place to just see penguins and whales and seals and and everything and icebergs and, and the mountains and everything i'm like this is this is great i've got to get back down here and uh, i remembered all right let's let's join the antarctic program and and got you know after kind of did a rock and everything and then came back to melbourne and went all right let's let's get out of conflict diplomacy and go south and then went through the recruiting process which was um yeah pretty standard recruiting process with with a few extra antarctic psych tests and and some group based activities where you've got to go out and make sure you can work as part of a team because you're all stuck on the station together and uh, and then finally the the uh director of operations or, or operations manager called me up and just said hey do you want to want to go to davis as a station leader for a year in uh, from from October 2019 on a one year contract, and the, the rest was history from there. <laughs> so, for people who haven't read your your book yet, can you tell us what a standard day looks like on station and and in Antarctica? Yeah, well, it's it's very different. Sorry to cut you off. It's no, no, no. Very, very different to any other working working space. Well, it, it isn't. It isn't. So, first of all, for anyone that hasn't read the book, obviously buy the book. Uh, available now at all good bookstores and online and, and audio book and everything. But um, no, so the, there's no average day, and that's the great thing about those jobs. Uh, average day for the station, you've got tradies, you've got scientists, you've got meteorologists, you've got all sorts of different people, aviation, maritime all sorts of things going on. So for me, the day would start, you get out of bed, do some push-ups, kind of get yourself sorted for the day, go to brekkie at sort of seven o'clock, try and not answer too many work questions at the breakfast table, but that was inevitable that you're all there for work. So you, you, you talk work at, at brekkie, map out your day, check the weather. The, the weather is so important down there that it doesn't matter what your plan is. If the weather's bad, and by bad, you're talking you know, 100 knot winds is bad and blizzard. So 
you going outside if you if you don't it was there's this rule of like one kilo per knot of wind so if you you know you, you weigh less than 100 kilos going outside is going to be challenging at 100 knot wind so you, you check the weather and go okay that's what was forecast we can go with the plan you go to the ops meeting at eight o'clock you task all the assets everyone signs off on the plan and 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 the day starts generally with the helicopter and this is this is the first summer um before COVID and before things went wrong and you kind of go all right helicopters are going out if the weather's good for boats the boats will go out and you're seeing all these different field parties and scientists heading out to, to get their work done in the the summertime but it's a stark contrast to the winter so by the the end of summer so in, in around march when the ship came back for its last trip the aurora australis came back to it for its last trip to antarctica picked up the summer team and sailed north uh, and this is around the time everyone was told, like, oh, don't worry about this virus. It's just this like two week lockdown to flatten the curve. It'll all be done and dusted. And we're like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. We'll we'll just spend the next six or seven months here on on station, and uh, you'll come and get us after that. And the winter time, it's it's much more routine. So the trades have got this really strict maintenance register where the the, the mechanics, the builders, the plumbers and uh, sparkies everyone just go through and and you know audit everything in the station make sure it's running keep it going upgrade projects for the year ahead and all geared towards that second or that next summer is where you get all the work done and you're in this this routine and, and it's the same people you know we had 24 of us in that winter team same people at breakfast lunch dinner every day of the week you know you it's it's 24 is enough that you can hang out with different people at different times, but it's small enough that if someone's on your nerves or got a habit that you kind of go kind of like, oh, I wish, you know, it, it can just wear away at you and, and really push you to the limits. But we had a great team, and I think, uh, you know, if you had to do it all again, you, you'd, you'd go, yeah, that, that's that's the sort of team and that's the makeup and the dynamic that you'd you'd want. And, yeah, I, I, I loved it to the end, um, but I didn't necessarily love it every day. Because you went down for the start of the seventy third season, wasn't it? And then that turned yep. that turned into be the seventy fourth as well. So, yep. and- yeah, I think on our plaque we wrote that we, yeah we wrote on the plaque like summer, winter, summer, which was was very very rare for it. In, in, in fact, it hadn't really happened in in sort of modern history to have an entire team have to do summer, winter, summer. Individuals and, and smaller groups had had, had to do bits of that but we were the first group in a long time to have to get forced to do summer winter summer um and yeah we started to to call ourselves a 73rd and a half or technically by that second summer were the 74th an ra um which yeah (laughs) and what i loved in the book was when you when when you said you you just had the conversation about COVID and that you were going to have to stay another another season and and what I loved is that you in your leadership role like everything came to you and and you just you went I'm just going to tear the band tear the band aid straight off now get it done and was it being down there you were already so isolated but did you feel a sense of now even more isolation being that you weren't coming back and they then they didn't even consult you to say hey we're bringing you home you've got to do you've got to extend and, and I read it in the book and yeah was was that hard? yeah um it, it was really tough and it, for the people in the room when we broke that news and I'd let it out quietly to a couple of the team beforehand and and Everyone kind of knew that decision was coming, given what we knew about what the world, what was happening in the world, where the new icebreakers build was at, where the aviation assets were placed, and you know you could put two and two together that we were going to have to get ex- that extending us was a very safe option and the best of a of, of a whole range of options. So we sort of knew it was coming. It was the people that weren't in the room: your, your husbands, families, girlfriends, boyfriends, dogs, cats, whatever. That was the problem of you that that is then going to weigh on on each member of the team and their own individual challenge of what's happening back home. You know, you've got your wife back home with two kids homeschooling, um, and you're happily stuck in Antarctica for another summer with a, a decision. Yeah, you weren't really consulted on. That was hard. I had problems with my my employer. Were kind of like, oh, you were supposed to. Be, you we gave you twelve months leave without pay. Um, what do you mean you're there longer? And I'm like, and I had to, you know, got a letter from the 
directing the Antarctic program and said, well, it's actually, it's not his choice. And others had to do the same thing. You, you, you trying to explain it to everyone else, this situation we're in and, and roll through it. And it, the, we, we were told we were about the extension on 23rd of June, 2020, just after midwinter's day, which was 21st. And we, we should have been home a few months after that told we're staying into 2021 on, and we'd return home at some point then. And, it wasn't until we hit the 12 month anniversary. So we left Australia in October, 2019, when it got to October, 2020, when we should have been going home, there was, you know, it, it was tough and you're starting to then do things that we'd done when we arrived. So in terms of maintenance programs and different projects, you, you're like, Oh, that's all right. You know, I hope the last guy did a good job. And you're like, Oh man, the last guy. And you're like, that was, you know, that was me. And so <laughs> that there was a bit of that stuff, which is sometimes it was hilarious. And, and other times, any, any time you had a challenge or something went wrong or you were just over it. And, and this was myself and others and the whole team you, in the back of your mind, you're like, well, we're not supposed to be here. So if, if I wasn't here, I wouldn't have this problem. And that was the the crux of it. You go, well, we're not supposed to be here. So how do you reframe that? And for me as the leader, it was, some say, and, and I kind of agree this is, it's kind of easier as a leader in that position because you don't have much of a choice, that your job is to lead the team, so you lead the team. And you've got a lot of purpose. You're certainly going to have your work cut out for you in terms of the management and leadership side of it, so off you go. Whereas for others on, on station in different roles, is it easier or harder when you've got less control and the whole sphere of control around the mental health battle inside of it became really important. And, and then understanding your own motivations was another element that I found. I got really interested in unpacking and a few others I chatted to were really interested in this stuff, but a number of the team were just flat out, you know, it's just not for them to, to have those discussions or, or try and work out what's at the heart of your resilience or where you're at on your mental health battle. And you go, that's, that's fine. But I, I did feel, find it was those that were there for that true sense of adventure and that historical Antarctic expedition, kind of all those things that you think of. If you'd signed up for that and then you were faced with the challenges we were faced with, it made it easier to, to roll through and go, oh, this is what I wanted. I wanted a challenge. And if I'd gone down there and been a station leader on any of the other years before that, um I might have got a book deal, but it wouldn't have been as interesting and as uh, kind of yeah, successful as a, as a book and as a story if it hadn't been for the challenges and the problems we had along the way. And, and what I loved about your writing, Dave, was that and reading the book is you don't shy away from being the leader and you, and you don't shy away from what you could have done and could have done better, what you did well and what you, what you could have done better. And, and I like that in, in a leader because lead, it starts at the top and like at the end of the day, the, the, the blame ends with you. Like you, you take that, like no matter you take the leadership role, of course, there's going to be people that don't like you. And, and for you, like, who did you turn to? And, and obviously, you mentioned at the start of the podcast, Teddy Roosevelt, you mentioned in the arena. But in the, in the dark times, for you, who did you turn to, to? Because you were in such a unique... This this hadn't been an experience before. So who did you turn to? It's, I love that question. And it's, it's so simple. The only people I wanted to speak to were the other station leaders, so the other Australian stations. Um, and we'd have these... We'd have a WhatsApp group and we'd have little Zoom meetings occasionally or phone conferences when the, the internet wasn't good enough uh, and just or chat one-on-one -on -one about what's happening at your station and half the problems were the same, you know, different locations, same problem. And a number of the team did the same thing. You know, my, my lead builder or the plumbers or whatever, they didn't want to speak to me. They didn't want to speak to the head of HR. They didn't want to speak to a psych. They didn't want to speak to, they, I want to speak to the builder at another station was generally your first point of call. And for me, that was the other station leaders or historical station leaders. So people that had, I'd, I'd read the log. So on the, you know, every day you, you go through, you write the station log or you read what's happened that time of the year and what the sea ice is going to do when the seals are coming back and the wildlife and some of these different elements of, of the station and the environment. And you'd, you'd read a note from say 10 years ago from the station leader, like on this date, I did this and you go, ha, oh, I've got the same problem and and every time i'd call one of them or email them and say hey i just uh, i just read your log and and uh 
saw this, they they were more than happy to pick up the phone and just have a great laugh and relive their time on station and their memories. And they're like, oh, someone's reading my log. I'm like, yeah, well, you're stuck in Antarctica for a year and a half. You, you do a lot of reading. And those moments were great and, and reset me to realize that, yeah, as tough as our challenge has what well, it is at the time and was, um, that we're not the first people to get stuck in a, in a tough winter or a, or a tough Antarctic situation. And that gave me a lot of uh, perspective of like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's either hilarious because it happens every year or it's, it's not a new challenge. And if, if they got through it, um, yeah. And, and sometimes their advice was, was right. And sometimes it was wrong and you make your own decision of whether you, you listen to it. And just because they're like, Oh, that's what I did in 2004 or something. You go, that doesn't mean it was the right thing to do. And that was, that was, the other thing I wanted to convey in the book when I wrote it, and so I'm glad you, you appreciated that, is that half the time you, you know, you, you you don't know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, and that's where that man in the arena stuff comes comes into it. Of like, well, it doesn't matter. Like, you just keep going. You're the man in the arena. You you go. You're the station leader. Make the call. Move forward. You'll get it wrong. You'll get it right. And at the end of the day, if everyone comes home safely, you you know, you made the right calls. And. I love there's a there's a quote that that I live by because I'm you know I, I'm a deputy captain up in my local fire brigade and the greatest advice I ever got from a crew leader was the worst decision is a decision not made so whether it's right whether it's wrong just make a decision yep. and you know that's exactly what you did you know and the best thing with your writing was that you you put your hand up and go, yeah, I, I did some things good and I did some things that, you know, I probably would have changed. In hindsight, if I, you know, knowing knowing what I know now, I, I probably would have made a different situation. But that's all hindsight. It's in the past. You can't, you know, and, and that's, that's what I loved about your book because it was, you know, you didn't shy away from that. And, and so when you're on station did everyone come together like a big family or was, was and or was there a bit of was there a bit of animosity in amongst the in amongst everyone as well well uh, look we're there for a year and a half so it's, it's not all sunshine and penguins uh and, and family is probably the best analogy and i like to tell people like if you went on holidays with your 23 best friends um you know, how long would you last before it, it, you start to have disagreements and arguments? And not, I, I think clicks is the wrong word. There was certainly different group dynamics, it, largely based around either age or experience or roles. So you, you go, well, of course, those guys hang out together because, you know, they're all from the same kind of work and background. And, and that doesn't mean they're a click. It just means like, well, it's the stuff they're going to talk about at dinner. It's different to the stuff that we're going to talk about at dinner. And, and you, you had to then – and there was a lot of things naturally that break that down. It's great that you mentioned you're a firefighter because down in Antarctica, there's no firefighters, there's no medical facility, there's one doctor. So you've got all these other secondary functions. So there's four people that get trained as surgical assistants and then everyone's on a fire team. So they won't necessarily be your main colleague. So if you work as, uh, in the, as a meteorologist, uh, you're, you're working with that team. But then on the fire team, you'll be with a bunch of plumbers and, and sparkies and tradies or engineers or something. So all of that flip, flips around and helps break up any dynamics and, and clicks and everything that would form. And the group training or even things like the band, we did some art shows, we did fancy dress parties and all sorts of ridiculous stuff that everyone did in lockdown last year, uh, the last couple of years too. We did all that in the station and that helps keep the group together. And moments like the midwinter dinner, the end of summer, winter, summer dinner and, and New Year's and birthdays. And they were the only events that really got full attendance every time. And it was those moments that you'd often see people bury hatchets of, yeah, we you know, we don't get along and I, I don't really like that person for whatever reason or whatever. But on, on those occasions, everyone seemed to rise above it and be like, oh, yeah, this is, yeah, I'll, I'll pay, pay credit to that or, yep, yeah, I'll bury the hatchet tonight and then go back to not necessarily being friends with them, but being a professional colleague the next day. And that's just humans. I think you learn a lot about it. And I did find at times when it, when I felt like it was not going in the right direction and you just go, could, could someone have done a better job of this? So is there a better way or was there an answer to some of these questions? And and most of the time, you know, I might've just been delusional, but just be like, well, 
I don't know. I don't know if there was a better way to do this. And the best way we did the best thing we could at the time and we, we went forward and we're all still here and we're all still having dinner together. So let's go. And there was some, yeah. So towards the end of the book, you talk about the medical evacuation and the multiple coordinating of parts of this operation. Thinking back, were there any particular life experiences that you were able to draw on in the moment to get the job done? Yeah, that was um, so. That was you know, well, well over the one year mark. Uh, you know, ten days before Christmas, and the doctor sort of walks into my office and says, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna evacuate a patient back to Australia for urgent care." And we had to coordinate with the, the Chinese and American programs to to set up a remote runway and and evacuate. It's it's a harrowing chapter in the book, and that was straight away. And and this is where the Antarctic station leader role is really varied. That you need to be very democratic, very socialist, very group oriented, um, and, and very much taking opinion. But at times, the buck stops with you, and you have to be a very decisive and direct leader and make decisions. When it came to the, the emergency, and, and every time we'd done emergency scenarios up until that point, we generally do some sort of training scenario once a month or so, and they'd be everything from fire on station to a lost expeditioner to a, a, a field emergency, and we'd, we'd drill those things. But everyone knew in an emergency, it, that's it, that the station leader takes absolute control and makes decisions, and, and it goes from there. And I really then, in that when that emergency was declared and we we had to do it, which was a decision made by the medical team to say this is this is go. I just snapped and went purely operational and and I reckon just went back to um, infantry officer Dave and went cool. This is it. This is it. this is the ultimate um, kind of battlefield evacuation scenario. And you just go right. You do your IMAP for those military listeners out there. You just your first thing I did was scratch out the time and space and go right. How long have I got? And then you, you go, you, you, what assets have I got? What time frames am I working on? What are the biggest risks? What are the three courses of action? You just go through that. And I reckon I did that instantaneously and your brain just goes, Phew. and that's from years and years of thinking like that. And you, you brief the team, you give the plan, you back brief it, you, you run troops to task to, to make sure everyone's got a job and resting people was important. So you're going, right, there's going to be a 10-day operation. I need everyone that's not on this particular list here just go and sleep or go and double check that you, you, your rounds are done in terms of what you've got to do on station to keep the place running and then just chill out and relax because when it comes to it, we might have to work uh, you know, all night. And in the end, when the operation actually went down, the weather window was from uh, 11 p.m. to 0300 local time. So uh, it, it all wrapped up at 0300 and 24th of December 2020 and we sat down for Christmas the next day and, and that was – a really interesting vibe and you know we were so we'd worked so hard and there was so much to be proud of operationally and it, it, you know there's a lot of luck involved with the weather too in in some ways but you know luck's preparation many opportunity as they say and all of that and you go great we just evacuated this patient we saved someone's life and, and this is incredible and you know wow it's christmas it's our second christmas you know what are we celebrating? We should have been home by now. And that was just one of those moments that you just can't buy. And when I did the Unforgiving 60 the other week uh, on their podcast, they asked me about these kind of, as, um, as uh, Benny Pronk called it, you know, SAS moments in his mind. And I called them hashtag Antarctica moments, but generally the 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 exciting moments. But no, no the, the, the sort of human experience of that second Christmas, the day after we completed the medical evacuation and – you just can't describe it and you, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it, it's one of those moments in sort of human emotion that you go, wow, what a, what a situation to be in. And um, I think I said at that, that dinner, uh, and yeah, it's 24 hours of daylight in the middle of summer as well in Antarctica. So it doesn't really matter what time you're eating. It's, it's always feels like lunch. And, uh, and you know, I said something along the lines of you, you can't, you can't choose your family and you, you, you sort of can't choose your, your Antarctic uh, expedition team and, and Merry Christmas and, and I'm glad to be spending it with all of you or something like that and it was, yeah, it, was a, it was a very emotional day it, it would have been mate and, and my my brain went into eye task and smeak straight away as soon as, you, <laughs> yeah. so, as, as, soon as you said oh, that. <laughs> I love that and I, I'm glad you so you would have picked up on that stuff in early on in the book because the, the Australian Antarctic Division yep. 
in their emergency planning use the SMEAC orders orders format and, and these other elements, but yep. they've sort of cut out or just not gone through all the other processes of the actual like the IMAP and CMAP and stuff before that. And yep. yet they use it as a, as a method of delivery for the orders groups. And so, yeah, when I was doing the training at the division before going south and I'm like, they're, they're kind of going, oh, this is this, you know, this is the, the kind of the most amazing way to deliver us a, a task. And I'm like, yeah. I turned to my boss, who was who was ex-army as well. We, we both just laughed. You're like, yeah, mate. You're like, yeah, great, great, great briefing. Oh, we, we know how it works, and uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot more to the background of how you come up with the plan. Yeah, yep. and that was one of the things I ran a professional development thing down there for field trips where we went through. Uh, I called it the ice map, patent pending or, or copyright. Don't steal that, and and the ice map process to plan a field trip and work out, okay, what are the worst things that can happen on this field trip in terms of where, where's my maximum search and rescue range and how long would it take to get a response to me? And, and some really simple field trips would become very high risk very quickly when you realize like, oh, hang on a minute, it might take eight hours to get support if we're on land, on rock, and there's no vehicle access and there's no helicopters. An eight-hour wait for for, for – assistance turns a like you know, ruptured knee or you know twisted knee where you can't walk in non-ambulatory and you don't have four people to carry you in a stretch there's no trees down there either so no stretches um you know, and sometimes the field huts might be two or three k's away so you're like it's two or three k's to a stretcher two or three k's back so there's you know a couple of hours before you can even move this patient and then that was some interesting stuff that um I found it interesting. I don't know how well oh, it was well received yeah, by the right. team. By the team, it was at times for for me to go down those rabbit holes, but it, it helped people understand the um, the military thinking behind that SMEAC stuff. And well, we were talking before we started the podcast that I'm doing my remote area first aid at, at the moment, mm. and made it, it exactly what you're saying. It's like, and what our instructors teaching us is that the slightest medical condition, if you're in a remote area or you know you're, you're in an isolated situation, it can turn life and death very quickly. And and you, you're not, you, you know, and and it is. It's it's great, like that you're saying, and it's good for any young, you know, any young corporal, lance corporal, sergeant, you know, officer training now who listens to this podcast to actually know, actually, you've got to think of these things. It's not just, you know, you, you actually do have to think of the, the worst case scenario. Oh. Ho- ho- plan for the best? Uh, well, at, uh, sorry. Yep. Ho- uh, yeah. Plan for, Plan the, for the worst, hope for the best. And that's, you know, that's exactly what it is. That's leadership. And and it's it's a great example of what you've just said, you know, like 100%. You, you have to. Oh, my my, fa- my favorite test was uh, weighing people's field packs. So just when, before they went out on out in the field, they'd line up, people would just line up their packs around the mess and and they'd have to turn their tags, sign out, grab their radios and off they'd go. And the, and there's, there's stuff about this. There's three cot three kinds of hikers and three kinds of expeditioners. You've got your novice whose pack weighs, you know, 50 kilos. They've got everything. They've got stereos. They've got books. They've got more jackets and socks than you can poke a stick at. And they, they get out the door and they're like, geez, this bag weighs a ton. Then you've got your kind of your second season expert who's been there, done that. They know everything. They've got the bare minimum in their bag. It weighs five kilos. They've got one liter of water, one extra muesli bar, and that's it. And I could walk past and just pick up the packs and be like, yeah, no, I know who that is. And then, but then your field training officers, so the most experienced guys in Antarctica that run all the field training, and they've these are guys that have been down crevasses rescuing people and and been in you know crashed helicopters scenarios and the real pointy end of of as bad as it gets down in Antarctica, and their packs weigh you know twenty or thirty kilos full of just absolutely everything for people that have forgotten their other jackets, extra beanies, extra socks, like a week's worth of food, a week's worth of fuel, an extra stove, like all this stuff. You're like, what are you do? like? Oh, we're just going for a picnic. It's like a two hour walk. And you're like, Oh yeah, but yeah, that's, you don't know. <laughs> and no, so, yeah. When you, so when you're there and, and times were really, really tough and it, it was there ever a, on station, was there ever a time that you that you all thought this is never going to end? We're just we're just going to be here forever. Not really. We did um, like we had 
two years worth of food and fuel. We would have had to ration the fuel a bit, but we could have we could have got through. And then the food could have even lasted longer. And there's so in in a kind of doomsday scenario, we we actually had no organic assets to get us home. We had we had three IRBs. So first we could get you know 10, 10 nautical miles or so before you you just can't carry enough fuel to drive those things. So no organic way of really getting home. Um, had enough food and fuel. We had we we had five years supply of toilet paper. We ordered it that and, well, and we, checked we, that at one point. So we would have run out of food we before had, we ran out of we toilet had paper. In and um, Australia, mate. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, we, uh, yeah, in the back of your mind, at points, it would have crossed crossed over to be like, oh, what if, what if, just one day, there's just no, the phones don't work, there's no internet, there's no HF comms, like there's nothing. You'd be like, oh, all right, and we would have crossed that bridge. And a few of us, um, now myself, the chef, who was my deputy station leader and an absolute superstar, and the real hero of the book, I think, is the the chef, um, my deputy. She's a, she was just the best, and. Her and I had some chats about what second winter would look like because there was a, a small but but possible chance that if if the ship that was coming to get us had had any dramas or had been delayed or um, the issue, I want to not spoil it for those that haven't read the book. To, to you know, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about when you listen to this. That if if some of the things that happened on our voyage home had happened on the ship's voyage south. Uh, we would have had to stay for another a winter or very likely would have. And we had enough stuff to get through that. It, it would have been a pretty tough challenge for the team um, once we knew we were going home and we saw the ship and that, that was sort of coming to an end. You go, yeah, that's 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 enough. But, yeah, the, what I talk about in mental health, like having a horizon to swim to, when that horizon's moving and for us even as well, not knowing what, setting foot on that horizon and and kind of returning to the COVID world was going to look like, that level of anxiety probably had a bigger toll on us than we we realised. So in the book, you, you talk about Anzac Day and how important it was for you. What in particular about Anzac or the Anzac legend helped get you through? Yeah, it was more the historical significance of it. So there was only... The, the Antarctic stations and the, the war memorial that were really around, allowed to hold events. Now, I know a lot of RSLs and other places had small private events or they they, they, they did a few things and everyone did the driveway um, ceremonies and possibly around the world in, in countries that didn't have lockdowns, they might have you. But officially, when I spoke to the war memorial, it was a case of there's the war memorial and there's the Antarctic stations and that's about it for places that'll have a crowd and we only had the 24 of us there and you go all right great that's that's historically phenomenal like wow what a what a moment and i I run up i run a new flag up there a new anf up the flagpole that day and framed that afterwards to say hey this is this crispy blue bad boy flew on anzac day at davis in 2020 in a year when when very few places had an anzac day ceremony so that to me was important um i'd say yeah served in uniform and and you kind of it means a lot to you, but for my family, it had a, a weird significance too. That it was my grandma's birthday, and she died the year before at the ripe old age of of a hundred. So she she'd made it to the ton, and she'd been a phenomenal influence on on myself and my family. Having fled, um, you know, she sort of fled the Soviets and the Nazis, and and fled across Europe to to get to Australia with her, my grandfather and her husband and, and have their kids in Australia. And they'd lost a kid along the way in, in Europe and she outlived two of her kids and and had a really, but st- just had such a positive life. You know, it's the same with the way everyone saw Queen Elizabeth. You just, she just had this kind of enduring positivity of everyone's grandma and our, our grandma was kind of the same as her birthday. And so that was the first birthday um, for us as a family that she hadn't been around. And I was stuck down there in Antarctica kind of, Doing the ode of remembrance across the icy, icy shores of of Davis, yeah, you know, at, at the lovely time in an Antarctic uh, autumn of ten a.m. It's, and I suppose you sort of, in your sense, Dave, it's it's a unique like having Anzac Day in the in the southernmost point of the world. It's pretty special in its own its own right. Like, uh, look, I can see the significance for you. Like that that would be that would be really cool. Oh, it, it was, and and there was a, an interesting crowd. There was a few guys and girls in the team that had had um, military 
service before and, and everyone's got a family member or, or some sort of thing to it. But it was also just a good day to, to kind of bring everyone together and, and remember we're part of something, something bigger and, and Antarctic service, you know, it's, it's not military service. It's different, but certainly in the, the heroic age of it, it was very well tied to your military types and having done both, I, I can tell you now some of the challenges and struggles of, of, you know, Antarctic service are similar. Um, you don't, you're not getting shot at, so that's straight away slightly different. But um, it's uh, the operational environment, the team, the team dynamic, the the isolation, the the focus, and the the operational focus of we're here to get a job done, we're here to do it. All of that stuff's exactly the same, and yeah, it's it's pretty a, a similar vibe that you could go from a. Uh, a forward operating base in a modern war zone to an Antarctic station. And the only thing that you'd really notice straight away is that all, right, all the buildings are colored. They're not camouflage and the layout, the the elements of it, are the mess timings, the social functions, the different emergency planning teams and the strategies and you're on call, you're not on call, you're the watch keeper, you're not, all of that stuff is, is exactly the same. So resilience and endurance and you've had to go through a little bit of that in your early years of losing your dad and and going into war zones and seeing what you know other people have had to endure and for you after 537 days what does what did you learn about your own resilience and endurance and what have you learned since this experience yeah it's it's a great question um I learned that fundamentally resilience comes down to your motivation of if you know why you're there and what you're doing. And for me, that was I wanted an Antarctic challenge and I wanted a leadership challenge and I certainly got them. So once I kind of unlocked that, it, it made every challenge or every time I thought I was failing, you just double down and you go harder because you're like, I, I made a decision to come here, to lead this team and to be in this scenario. And I became thankful for as, as hard as it got, you become more motivated and more thankful for it to be like great of course this is harder and cool that's that's yeah let's go you know yep yeah, th- this is what i wanted and that's what i learned that the, the more you can understand your own motivation the more resilient you will be um because if you don't have that motivation or that quest or that that survival instinct if i have to achieve this if you start going well, why why am i doing this like oh, i don't want to do that you, you, your ability to be resilient is wafer thin. You just you're gone. So knowing your own why, when you when you sign up for something like an Antarctic expedition or a job or a volunteer role as a firefighter or whatever, know why you're doing it. Because when it gets tough, you'll need to know that. And that's yeah, people that go, oh, I'm going to study part time. Why? Oh, I'll be good on my resume, mate. You're going to drop out in like a year. You got nothing. Um, but if you go, no, I want this because I need to. I need to be more qualified to get to be more competitive, to get the job I want, to get the lifestyle I want for my family, for my kids or whatever it is. And and the minute you've got that locked down, you, you're home and home. So that's part of it. How did I, I change? And I, I think when I got back, I realized that as, as challenging as it had been and as resilient as I'd, you know, all the resilience we'd, dem- we'd demonstrate as a team to get through all that sort of stuff, I still realized that re- resilience is a moving target that you might be resilient enough to get through a year and a half in Antarctica. But when you get back to Australia and you're trying to work out what the hell to do with your life and where to go, and you don't have that purpose and that why you can be very unresilient and you're, you're short tempered and you're confused and you, you don't know what's going on. So that was, that was something that surprised me of almost how fickle resilience can be that it, uh, you might have it one minute and not the next. And I know that um, Dan Pronk talks about this a bit in his, his books and 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 his sort of his story of how how getting out of the army was was one of the tougher challenges compared to all the stuff he did in Afghanistan. Well, I was going to ask you for you your thoughts on when you left Davis. What because you'd been there for a year and a half. That was home. What was what was it like coming back to Australia and and your actual home? Yeah, that was <laughs> the funny one. Was I? So I went back to Antarctica uh, nine months later as the voyage leader for, a, for which most people go like, "What are you yeah, doing?" You couldn't get but it, of it mate, or? yeah, couldn't get enough of it. Um, so I went back as the voyage leader on a, on a cargo ship to to Davis and Mawson. Going back to Davis 
was weird to see another station leader and a whole other team there who'd made it their own home and they had their own way of doing it. And even when I when I got off the, you know, I went ashore on, on sort of day one of the resupply to chat to the station leader and the ops co- or the um, resupply coordinator and just sort of just, just make myself at home, just go to the coffee machine, start making the coffee. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll do the meeting up there. And, and she she was great, but she was, I think at, at a point she's like, don't tell me what to do, and I'm like, oh yeah, well yeah. But then we we had this great great chat, and they yeah, it was it was a lot of fun to go back and see the station and see how how people had changed things or, or what had moved around and, and that. But um, readjusting to life back home was was tough. I knew I knew I probably didn't want to go back to my old job, um, and that was a big life changer to be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get out of of what's been a pretty comfortable run professionally in terms of look comfortable in terms of the superannuation not comfort in terms of the locations but get out of the, the public service system and, and go out on my own and and start consulting to to different firms and companies and schools and running talks on resilience and just really telling my story and, and the lessons learned out of that from the leadership side of things and then yeah speaking to publishers and and it was really nerve-wracking um and probably the most difficult like cha- difficult and challenging life decisions I've ever made is is that stuff to go like all right I'm gonna write a book you know can I I've never written a book before in my life so I'm like all right can I write a book how is it is it going to be I mean we were talking about this before when talking about your your book project you go you know there's a book you want to write and then there's the book that's marketable and and profitable and and it is a good business decision for a publisher to to pick up your book and you're trying to match that as an author um to make sure that it, and, and is it the right is it the right mix of emotion like you, the stuff you talked about is am i vulnerable enough am i showing the truth am i just p- portraying myself as a complete wanker um what am i doing here like it, what's true and and i worked with and in real full credit to the the team that i had around me for that from kelly at good content cal who helped coach me with the process but also members of my own team from davis who fact check things and, and made sure that we got it right and they could vouch to say, yep, no, nah, you've you've hit that on the head there of yeah, you yeah, you got that wrong. And uh you've admitted that and that's cool. And you go you go from there. And and that was that was great to have that support too. So writing the book and you mentioned it like you've mentioned it a little bit, but what was the most challenging part for you and and obviously you had to consult with the team a lot and did you like did you have to on certain parts ask them and get their re like what their story was and obviously there's two sides to every story what was the most challenging part of writing it for you yeah so that that probably is it is, is getting that the narrative correct um i didn't engage I, I, did, I had a few conversations with a couple of key members of the team very early to say, "Hey, I'm I'm, I'm going to I've been offered a book deal. What are your thoughts?" And 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 they were were really supportive to say, "Yep, yeah, absolutely, tell the story, do it, do it right, do it your way, and off you go." And uh, happy to to chat along the way. So then I went away and just wrote the book and it took about four to six months in lockdown. 5.0 or whatever it was from sort of mid 2021 to late 2021 and in that lockdown on and off no social life kind of thing and and wrote the book then and once i had it written i then took it back to a couple of the members of the team in in either in its entirety say hey have a look at this or specific chapters to say hey you know you were the, you were the lead plumber um this is a whole chapter about the antarctic stations and their water supplies can you just run an eye over that for the technical side of it, but also the emotional stuff? And and you know they they read it, come back and say, yep, no, oh, this is this is right here technically, but also narrative wise, that's pretty good. And the, the bigger challenge then was, you know, there's not 24 characters in the book. There's about five or six and key characters and then a couple of other like periphery characters. It's getting them right as a mixture of representing different demographics or different themes or different attitudes in the group that aren't necessarily just one person. So you've got these little bit characters that will turn up and someone might, and and then having to balance, okay, someone's going to identify as that character or that particular exchange over breakfast happened. But the character in the book 
of which that exchange happens is also the same character that did something else later on that that person will go, well, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd had that argument over breakfast, but I didn't do that. And you're like, you're not, you know, Adam or whatever. You, you Like that character in the book is based on two or three different scenarios and two or three different people that did that one thing multiple times or, or an event that played out over two or three weeks has to just come out as one scene in the book. And and some of those challenges of how do you get that right and how do you make sure that, you know, people aren't going to go, oh, that's that's ridiculous, that never happened, which to date no one's no one's done. Everyone's been like, you know, everything that happened happened. And that's that's I put my hand on my heart and say that everything that happened happened in that book. But the the way it's framed and characterized is uh is is jumbled around well, occasionally. It's, it's a credit to you, Dave, because it's a very good read and it's a very easy read. Like it's it's and the way you've structured the book is it's it's very easy to follow from start to finish. And and I want to commend you on that because it's I know my <laughs> I know I'm going through the process at the <laughs> moment and it is it's it's a challenge to make it and sometimes I look at it and go is this even going to be readable like you, so so you're <laughs> very well on that mate and, and I want to say well done on the way that you did structure the book because it 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 is an easy read and I I enjoyed every minute of reading the book and that's why I wanted to get you on the podcast and so for your plans going forward what are they what what do you what do you, what do you want to do into the future yeah, so I'm uh, hoping to go back down to Antarctica this summer in a in a slightly different different role, and a lot of that though is just it's such an addictive and incredible place, and I love working down there. So any any time someone dangles that carrot, I, I'm generally entertaining it. Uh, so hopefully I'll go back down this summer in a in a new and exciting role that I haven't done before, um, and. Long term, yeah, selling the book and like you're kind of getting the book out there to tell the story is is fun and enjoyable doing like author nights, but I don't think that's sustainable. I really like working with school groups and doing workshops for different corporates on on leadership and management and that that space is is one that I enjoy working in and um, look forward to doing. But I also want to do it. I, I reckon I'll, I'm coming around to doing a fiction book. So I found, like you say about the structure of this book, it's actually pretty straightforward because – it's just how it happened. Now, we moved a couple of events, but minor, minor changes. And it just flowed. Like that's how our year and a half, like that's how it went. That all of the things, all the culminating activities, like the medical evacuation and the what happens on the voyage home and all this stuff, it all just happened how it happened. So <laughs> writing the book, writing a nonfiction biography is pretty straightforward because you know who you are, you know what happened, you just write it. Writing a fiction book, where you've got to invent characters and invent invent things and get that structure right. I think that'll be an interesting challenge. So I'd like to write a fiction book, probably based on on a lot of experiences I had in in Pakistan and and that time, um, which yeah you know, it, it would be influenced by a lot of true events, but at the same time like a, a fictional story in and around it, as many many authors have done. Um, a la kind of uh, the Flashman Chronicles. If anyone, if any, if you've read them or any of your listeners have, they're a great read about that historical fiction sort of genre where you're, you're set amongst reality, but uh, very over the top and yeah, hilarious. So, Dave, how do people get a like? How do they follow you? How do they and how do they get in contact with you to get a signed copy of the book? No worries. So the book's available in all bookstores and, and online at Booktopia and, and Amazon and all those places. If you want a signed copy, you can grab them through my website, davidnoff.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at, at five five three seven days of winter uh, for sort of professional side of things. Yeah, hit me up through the website or through LinkedIn or and uh yeah, and I work through Saxton Speakers for for corporate events and and talks and everything there as well. So happy to chat to anyone and everyone about what they want, but may not be available over summer. <laughs> well, <laughs> as you just mentioned, yes. Yeah. Well, Dave, there's a there's a quote that I'd like to finish with, and, and I, I, your story is one of true courage, leadership, and resilience. And there's a quote that I'd like to finish with. It's courage, courage, and perseverance uh, have a magic talisman. 
before which difficulties and obstacles vanish into air, the courage of leadership is given is giving others the chance to succeed, even though you bear the responsibility of getting things done. Dave, your story and your the way you have the way you led down in Antarctica and and the 537 days. I believe this quote sums up your true your true resilience, your true courage and your true leadership and and I just want to thank you for coming on True Blue History and and thank you thank you first and foremost for your service to our country and thank you for writing this book. It's there are many vulnerable lessons and valuable lessons that everyone can learn from reading this book. So, Dave Knopf, thank you so much for coming on Triple History. No, oh, my my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, and, and great work with your podcast, and uh, all the best for the future with your book as well. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And if you feel like supporting us, you can now via our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash true blue history or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash true blue history and check out our new website, trueblue for more great content.